Okay, so this uh, lecture I've divided, organized into four parts. Um, and the first I thought uh, could would be a, 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 a brief review of kind of uh, basic concepts associated with quantum entanglement, um, ultimately lead into the standard definition of entanglement entropy, um, right? Because again, the context is uh, that the RT formula in ADS-CFT uh, states uh, 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 a, a relation between the entanglement entropy on the boundary with certain constructions in the bulk. Right? So to fully appreciate it um, in the first part, I'm gonna uh, do this brief review uh, of the definitions of quantum entanglement and ultimately entanglement entropy. Um, and then in part two, um, I'd like to look at uh, uh, three, let's call them three ancestors, predecessors of the RT formula. Um, that uh, are formally similar to the RT formula. Um, and we'll look at some of the motivations for these uh, other formula. So, so the three are the uh, famous beckenstein hawken formula for black hole entropy, um, a formula for entanglement entropy in quantum field theory. Um, and then the last example uh, is a, a slight extension of uh, entanglement entropy for quantum field theory uh, that leads to this concept of topological entanglement entropy. Um, and then in the third part of the lecture, uh, we'll finally get to the RT formula. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and here I'd like to discuss uh, one interpretation of it uh, given by uh, von Romstonk um, uh, fairly recently uh, that I'll call the connectedness entanglement hypothesis. Um, and it's this interpretation that suggests that the RT formula uh, states a duality between entanglement on the boundary with certain, uh, as we'll see, uh, spatial temporal constructions in the bulk. Um, and I'd like to consider the extent to which uh, we can consider it to be a duality in part three. Um, and then in the last part of the lecture, uh, I'll step back and consider the question of what would it take uh, to establish a duality? Um, and as I understand it, a duality is a one-to-one -one relation um, between space-time topology on the one hand and quantum entanglement on the other. Um, and I'll uh, address this question uh, from the point of view of two approaches, um, a state-based approach and an observable-based approach. Um, so uh, 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 let me begin with, with this review of hopefully uh, 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 concepts that, that we're all familiar with. Uh, uh, one, one goal of the, view, uh, of the review is to maybe uh, uh, um, um, establish uh, the terminology uh, uh, for later parts of the lecture. Um, right, so ultimately the review, uh, this review one, uh, is going to remind us of the definition, one common standard definition of quantum entanglement um, and uh, the definition of entanglement entropy. Um, so towards that end, let, let's briefly uh, remind ourselves of uh, uh, a bunch of definitions uh, lead into it, right? So the first is the definition of an density operator in quantum mechanics. So a density operator rho uh, for a system in one of a number of vector states, uh, each with some assigned probability p sub i is defined to be uh, a weighted sum of projection operators onto the individual vector states uh, weighted by the corresponding probability. Where of course the, the sum of the probabilities uh, uh, has to be one. Um, so uh, uh, by this definition, uh, right, uh, a density operator can correspond to more than one ensemble of vector states, uh, whereby an ensemble of vector states, uh, I mean, just a collection of vector states with a probability distribution assigned to them. So here are two distinct ensembles of vector states, each contained in two vector states with corresponding probabilities, right? Um, so they're different uh, ensembles, but we can represent them using the same density operator uh, provided the uh, vector states are related in an appropriate way. <clears throat> um, so uh, why use density operators to represent states as opposed to vectors? Right? And we're commonly told that uh, if we use a density operator, uh, then we can make this distinction between a pure state and a mixed state. Um, where a pure state is a density operator that can be expressed as a single projection operator onto a 
a single vector state. Um, if, if, if a density operator cannot be expressed in this way, then it's called a mixed state. Um, and uh, now let's remind ourselves of the standard warning against ignorance interpretation and ignorance interpretation of mixed states. Um, so here's a generic mixed state, um, rho equals right, some probability times the projection operator onto vector state psi one plus another probability times the projection operator into psi two, et cetera. And on the surface, uh, if our, the state of our physical system is represented by rho, uh, this might suggest that uh, uh, we don't know what vector state our system is in, right? It could be in vector state psi one with probability P1 or psi two with probability P2, et cetera. Right? So this suggests an ignorance interpretation of a mixed density operator state. Uh, but again, the standard warning is, uh, uh, well, there are two concerns with this ignorance interpretation. Um, and the first is right at, from the previous slide, uh, a, a given density operator uh, can represent more than one ensemble of vector states. Um, and the second concern uh, is uh, that an ignorance interpretation cannot be applied to a mixed state of a subsystem of a composite system uh, uh, when that composite system is in a pure entangled state. Um, and we'll see this uh, by a, a standard example in, in, in a couple of minutes. Right, so uh, uh, when you read in the literature uh, about density operators represent an uncertainty as, as with respect to states, uh, uh, you should take that with a grain of salt. Um, and uh, there's a quick and dirty test, right, to determine whether or not a density operator is pure or mixed. Um, uh, if the trace of its square is equal to one, uh, you can demonstrate that that entails it's pure. And if the trace of the square of its uh, of the trace of the square of the density operator is less than one, then the density operator is mixed. Um, or the trace of an operator is the sum of the diagonal elements of a matrix representation of it and uh, with respect to some basis. Um, now entanglement involves multipartite states, right? Um, in other words, uh, uh, vector states that are elements of a multipartite Hilbert space, a Hilbert space that can be decomposed into a product, right? uh, an n-partite product space. Um, and there, with respect to such an n-partite product space, uh, there are three different types of density operator. Um, so a product density operator, is a density operator that can be written as the product of n terms, where each term is a density operator on the corresponding uh, factor space. Right? Um, a separable density operator on a multipartite product space is a density operator that can be written as a sum of product density operators, a weighted sum of product density operators, right? where the sum of the weights equals one, and each term in the product again, is a uh, density operator on a corresponding uh, factor space. And then finally, a non-separable density operator is a density operator that is not separable. <clears throat> um, so in addition to multipartite states, entanglement also involves correlations. Um, so towards defining the notion of a correlation between observables with respect to a density operator state, let's recall the definition of the expectation value of an observable with respect to a density operator state. Right? And that's defined to be the trace of the product of the density operator with, with the operator that represents the observable. Um, and uh, recall the intuition underlying this definition uh, is the following, right? The expectation value is supposed to be the average value of the observable with respect to this the state rho. Um, and since density operators represent ensembles of vector states, the average value of O with respect to the density operator state rho should be a weighted sum of the value of O in each vector state um, weighted by uh, the corresponding probability. Right? So the expectation value of O with respect to the density operator rho uh, should be uh, the weighted sum of its expectation values with respect to the vector states 
uh, and the ensemble that the density operator represents weighted by the corresponding probabilities. And it turns out, right, this definition in terms of the trace, uh, if you expand out the definition of the trace, uh, you get uh, uh, the expression that underwrites this intuition. Um, so uh, correlated observables, right? So let OA and OB be operators on Hilbert spaces HA and HB with identity operators IA and IB respectively. Uh, then the observables represented by OA and OB are correlated with respect to the density operator state rho just when uh, the expectation value of the product operator OA cross OB with respect to the products, uh, the state row doesn't, does not factorize into the expectation values of the individual operators OA and OA and OB separately. Um, and the intuition for this definition uh, can be drawn from the corresponding situation uh, involving vector states. Um, so you can show uh, the Born rule entails that this corresponding non-factorizability condition for expectation values with respect to vector states holds if and only if uh, the corresponding Born probabilities satisfy this inequality. Right? Where on the left is the joint probability of obtaining values little a and little b of the two observables. And on the right are the marginals right, of obtaining the values uh, for OA and OB separately. Right? So uh, when the joint probability is not equal to the product of the marginals, uh, we say that the observables are statistically dependent with respect to the vector state psi. Um, and uh, the intuition then is a uh, uh, st statistical dependence is an indication of a correlation. Um, so uh, uh, the definition of correlated observables with respect to a density operator state. Um, now uh, you can then uh, uh, demonstrate the following claim. Um, observables represented by the operators that appear in a product operator are uncorrelated in a product density operator state and correlated in both separable and non-separable density operator states. Um, so uh, 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 the intuition underlying this claim can be motivated by the simple bipartite case. Right? So the claim is uh, the bipartite operator OA cross OB, the expectation value of it with respect to a product density operator state uh, uh, factorizes. Uh, by definition of the trace, whereas uh, the expectation value of this product operator with respect to a separable state does not factorize, um, and neither does uh, the expectation value of the uh, uh, product operators with respect to a non-separable density operator state. Right. So in the latter two cases, that, that's an indication of correlations. Um, and at this point, uh, authors uh, argue that uh, the correlations associated uh, with uh, um, uh, product operators with respect to a separable uh, density operator state uh, uh, can be classically explained. They can be uh, generated by classical operations um, insofar as they're the result of a classical mixture of product states. Whereas the correlations associated with observables in a non-separable density operator state cannot be so explained. Um, uh, uh, the term, the term is that they, they are, those correlations are non-classical. Uh, they cannot be explained in terms of uh, a, a classical mixture of product states uh, by definition of, the, uh, of, uh, of a non-separable density operator state. Um, so this, this distinction uh, between uh, classical correlations in a separable state versus non-classical correlations in a non-separable state then motivates uh, the standard definition of an entangled state. Um, a state represented by a multipartite density operator rho is quantum entangled just when rho is non-separable. 
Um, and here are two examples, maybe to make this definition a bit more concrete. Right? In the first example, we have a mixed separable density operator state that potentially exhibits classical correlations. And in the second example, we have a pure non-separable and hence entangled uh, density operator state that potentially exhibits non-classical correlations. Um, so having presented this uh, standard definition of an entangled state in quantum mechanics, um, at this point, we should be aware of the following qualifications, right? As presented in an article uh, in the past decade by John Ehrman um, on some puzzles and unresolved issues about quantum entanglement. Um, so Ehrman pops up in the form of right, this robot um, from the 1960s television series, Lost in Space. The robot goes around uh, exclaiming, warn and Will Robinson danger. And the danger here, according to Ehrman, is that there are at least four distinct definitions of a quantum entangled state, right? Uh, one of them being the previous definition in terms of non-separability. Um, and Ehrman, in this article, Ehrman provides counterexamples to each of these four definitions. Right? And then he goes on, moreover, to warn us uh, that, quote, uh, the impl implicit assumption in most of the philosophical literature and a good deal of the physics literature on quantum computing and quantum information theory that the composite system algebra has the structure of a tensor product of type one factors uh, is to be deplored because it neglects possibilities that need to be explored. So here he's concerned about uh, the notion of entanglement, for instance, in quantum field theory, um, which because of the nature of infinite degrees of freedom associated with such theories, uh, it turns out uh, uh, the state spaces are have the structure of uh, non, what are called non-type one uh, factors. Um, and this really, is, intuitively this entails that you, we cannot decompose the Hilbert space of quantum, a typical quantum field theory into a nice product of factor spaces. Um, and that problematizes the definition of, of entanglement. At least it problematizes, right? Any definition that assumes your Hilbert space has this nice uh, decomposition uh, into product spaces, in, into factor spaces. Um, but having been made aware of this concern and uh, this article by Ehrman, uh, for our purposes, for the purposes of this lecture, uh, for the purposes of introducing and understanding conceptually right, the implications of the RT formula, uh, we, we'll, we will stick with pure bipartite states for the most part. This really, the really simple uh, examples uh, for which uh, entanglement uh, uh, perhaps can be un unproblematically defined. Um, and uh, we'll deal with these problematic non-type one factor algebras that Ehrman is concerned about um, in one or two occasions when they arise. Um, all right, so the point here is that we should be aware that that uh, the, the definition of quantum entangled state is not without its controversy. Um, all right, so let's let's return to uh, our exposition. Um, so now that we have at least the standard definition of quantum entangled state, uh, let's uh, finish up the review uh, by uh, reminding ourselves of the definition of one proposed measure of entanglement um, as represented by the concept of entanglement entropy. Um, and to get to entanglement entropy, uh, let's slog through a few more definitions. So let's remind ourselves uh, of the definition of a reduced density operator. Um, so let's uh, let rho sub AB be a density operator for a composite system that decomposes into two subsystems A and B. Uh, then the reduced density operator for one of the subsystems, say A, is defined to be the partial trace with respect to the degrees of freedom of the other subsystem, in this case B, uh, of the uh, density operator uh, for the composite system, um, where the partial trace of a bipartite operator 
is defined to uh, uh, is given by tracing out the degrees of freedom of one of the of one of the subsystems. Um, so as an example, right here uh, is a non-product vector state uh, psi a b. Um, it's a two qubit state. Uh, um, uh, the corresponding density operator rho sub a b uh, is given by this expression. Right, this is a pure non-separable and hence entangled state. Um, we can then derive the reduced density operators for both of the subsystems, and they're given by these expressions. Ultimately, they're uh, proportional to the identity operators. Um, and both of them are mixed uh, density operator states. Um, and it's this example that uh, 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 underwrites one of the two concerns about ignorance interpretations of mixed states. Right? So the two reduced density operators are mixed states. Um, if we apply an ignorance interpretation to them, that would suggest that uh, the two subsystems, the two qubits, A and B, um, are, uh, in, are, are in unknown uh, vector states, right? Uh, rho sub A suggests under an ignorance interpretation that qubit A is either in uh, the state zero with probability of a half or the state one with probability of a half. And similarly, rho sub B suggests qubit B is in the state zero with probability of a half or the state one with probability of a half. We just don't know which of these two vector states the two qubits are in. Um, but this would suggest that the density operator for the combined two qubit state uh, should look like this, right? Uh, this is the density operator in which qubit one seems to be in state zero with probability of a half and qubit, sorry, qubit A and qubit B is in state zero with probability of a half. And similarly, qubit A is in state one with probability of a half and qubit B is in state one with probability of a half. Um, but by assumption, uh, that's, that is not the density operator for the composite state system. Right? Uh, uh, that density operator is given by this expression up here. Um, all right, so the definition for a reduced density operator. Um, with that in hand, uh, we can then remind ourselves of the definition of von Neumann entropy uh, of a density operator state. Um, and this is defined to be uh, minus the trace of the product of the density operator with its log, rho, log, rho. Um, now, uh, you can then show that uh, the von Neumann entropy of a density operator varies from zero uh, for a pure state to log in for a maximally mixed state uh, given uh, uh, um, uh, uh, which is uh, 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 proportional to, to the appropriate identity operator. Um, and this claim then indicates that um, explicitly, right, the von Neumann entropy is a measure of mixedness. It's a measure of the degree to which uh, a given density operator is, is mixed. <clears throat> um, now, it, it turns out uh, there are other ways of proposed ways of interpreting the von Neumann entropy, right, of a density operator. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, it, we should all be aware of these, of these different alternative interpretations. Um, I'm going to consider three of them in the form of asides, right? They're not really relevant to the topic of this lecture, but again, um, I think we should be aware of them. Um, so uh, the first aside, is uh, 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 the option of interpreting the von Neumann entropy of a density operator as a measure of information compression, right? Uh, and I take it this interpretation is motivated uh, by the analogy between the von Neumann entropy on the one hand and the Shannon entropy and classical information theory on the other hand. Uh, so the Shannon entropy is defined uh, with respect to what we might think of as an ensemble of classical states, right? uh, a collection of classical states, little x1 through xn with a probability distribution defined on them. Um, and the Shannon entropy of such an ensemble of classical states is defined as right, the weighted sum minus the weighted sum of log two of, 
uh, the probabilities weighted by those same probabilities. Um, and then there's an argument in classical information theory that underwrites the claim that the Shannon entropy so defined uh, specifies the minimal number of bits required to encode uh, the output um, of a classical information source, right? One of, one of the states of a classical ensemble, uh, an ensemble of classical states. Um, and uh, it turns out the von Neumann entropy can be rewritten in a form that's formally identical to the Shannon entropy. Um, and the only difference is, right, the von Neumann, in, in the von Neumann entropy context, the ensemble of states is an ensemble of quantum states, vector states, whereas Shannon entropy re refers to ensemble of classical states. Uh, but right, the, the analogy is uh, then motivates this interpretation that the von Neumann entropy of a density operator state specifies the minimal number of qubits required to encode uh, uh, the output of a quantum information source, right? a, a source that produces uh, uh, quantum vector states from an ensemble. Um, so that's a side one. Um, a, 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 another alternative interpretation of the von Neumann entropy is based on another way of interpreting the Shannon entropy, right? So a side two, um, the Shannon entropy can also be interpreted as a measure of uncertainty. Um, in this context, uh, we're told to identify uh, this expression minus log to the base two p sub i uh, as the information gained upon finding our system to be in one of the states of an ensemble of classical states, namely the one corresponding to the probability p sub i. Um, and the intuition here is that uh, the lower the probability of a state, uh, the more information gained when we measure the system and find it, it to be in that state. Whereas the greater the probability of a given state, the less information we gain when we measure the system and find that it's in, in that state. Um, so, and th so then the Shannon entropy is then interpreted as the expect expectation value of the information gained uh, when we measure our system and find that it's in one uh, of an ensemble of classical states. Um, and, and by analogy, right, this motivates the interpretation of von Neumann entropy as the expected value of information gained upon measuring um, our ensemble of vector states with a particular outcome. Uh, but this interpretation of von Neumann entropy, again, should be swallowed with a bit of salt, again, because explicitly, right, the von Neumann entropy is a, is a measure of the degree to which the density operator state is mixed. And as we saw, uh, mixedness does not necessarily entail uncertainty. Um, all right, and as a, the last aside, uh, uh, there's also uh, uh, an interpretation of the von Neumann entropy as simply thermodynamic entropy, call it S sub T. Um, and whether or not you subscribe to this interpretation seems to depend on your answer to the following two questions. Um, first, uh, is a quantum measurement associated with an increase in thermodynamic entropy? And second, uh, is a quantum measurement associated with a transition between a pure state and a mixed state? Um, and I take it uh, von Neumann initially, originally answered yes to both of these questions. And this was the motivation for him to initially introduce what we now call von Neumann entropy. Um, uh, but uh, uh, at this point, let me leave, leave this aside with the following observation that, that this is still a fairly uh, active debate in philosophy of physics and also in physics too, right? Um, there are some philosophers who think uh, there, are, there are flaws in von Neumann's original argument um, and other philosophers have, have suggested, no, uh, these flaws can be addressed, right? And, and this is still an ongoing debate. Um, this recent article by Prunkel uh, from 2020 is, is a good introduction uh, to this debate. <clears throat> um, but at, for the purposes of, of, of this lecture, uh, I, I think I'll leave it at, at, at this point. Um, so that's von Neumann entropy and, and um, 
what it measures explicitly, mixedness, and three uh, potential alternative interpretations of it. Um, so now we finally get to uh, the definition of entanglement entropy. Right? One way, one proposal for a measure of, of entanglement. Um, so the definition is the following for a bipartite system AB with density operator rho sub AB, the entanglement entropy S sub A of one of the subsystems, say subsystem A, is defined to be the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density operator associated with that subsystem. Um, and by definition of von Neumann entropy, that's equal to minus the trace of the reduced density operator times log of the reduced density operator. Um, now, again, just as von Neumann entropy explicitly is a measure of mixedness, uh, so is entanglement entropy. Um, S sub A is a, uh, a measure, in the first instance, it's a measure of the degree to which the density operator rho sub A is mixed. Um, now, you can demonstrate the following claim. Um, if rho sub AB, the density operator that represents the state of our composite bipartite system, uh, is a pure state, uh, then it is separable uh, if and only if uh, the entanglement entropy with respect to A is less than or equal to the von Neumann entropy of the composite pure state. Um, and this indicates the following. Uh, um, if a bipartite system is in a pure state, um, and if entanglement is defined in terms of non-separability, uh, then the entanglement entropy of one of the subsystems of the bipartite system uh, is a measure of the degree, degree to which the density operator of the composite system is entangled. Um, or more provocatively, uh, in this context, uh, the entanglement entropy of subsystem A uh, can be thought of as a measure of the degree to which subsystem A is entangled with subsystem B. Um, so I take it that's the sense in which entanglement entropy uh, 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 is a measure of entanglement. Um, now, having said that, right, uh, again, let's, let's just remind ourselves once more of, of Ehrman's warning. Um, uh, in the general case of mixed states um, for uh, systems uh, that can be decomposed into more than two parts, uh, uh, this simple way of measuring entanglement uh, of, of entanglement uh, 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 might break down, right? Uh, in this more general case, um, in fact, uh, there's a large literature on on different proposals for measures of entanglement. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, for the general case of mixed states and in partite systems for n greater than two. Um, again, for the purposes of, of this lecture, um, I'm going to sweep all this literature under the rug and represent it uh, uh, by that portion of, a, of our conceptual map uh, uh, associated with, with, with dragons. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, uh, I'd like to conclude this, this review of right, uh, the standard definition of quantum entanglement um, and this one proposal uh, of a measure for it as embodied by entanglement entropy. Again, right, the, the, the context is going to be the RT formula is a formula that relates entanglement entropy on the one hand to, to on the boundary to various uh, uh, bulk constructions. Um, so let's I'd now like to move on to part two. Um, and this part involves uh, a, a review of three uh, formula that uh, 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 formally are similar to the RT formula. Um, the beckenstein hawken black hole entropy formula, the formula for what's called geometric entanglement entropy in the context of quantum field theory, and then finally, um, a slight extension of the latter to what's called topological entanglement entropy. Um, so the first of our three ancestors uh, is this formula, the beckenstein hawken formula for black hole entropy um, introduced in an article by Beckenstein in 73. Uh, so the quantity on the left is the entropy associated with a black hole. And on the right, 
uh, is the area of the event horizon of the black hole divided by four times the Newtonian gravitational constant. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, there are at least two ways to motivate this formula, uh, uh, one from thermodynamics and the other from statistical mechanics. Um, and here I'm following uh, um, a review article by David Wallace uh, from 2018, where he describes these motivations. Um, so in the thermodynamical category, um, it turns out uh, small scale interactions between black holes and other states of matter uh, can be characterized as reversible and irreversible um, with the horizon area playing the role of thermodynamic entropy. Um, this was argued in a paper by Chris Adolu and Ruffini in 71. Um, and then uh, stationary black holes uh, uh, satisfy a formula that uh, is formally similar to the first law of thermodynamics, provided again, we identify Black, uh, the, event, the area of the event horizon with thermodynamic entropy um, and the surface gravity of the event horizon with thermodynamic temperature, right? Uh, and uh, the argument for this was given in this famous article by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawken on the laws of black hole mechanics in 73. Um, and then finally, there's Hawken's area theorem in general relativity uh, that states that in finite processes involved in black holes, uh, the change in area of the event horizon has to be greater than or equal to zero. And, and the analogy here is with the second law of thermodynamics. <clears throat> um, um, so in addition to these thermodynamic motivations uh, for the Bekenstein-Hawken formula, there are also statistical mechanical motivations, uh, according to Wallace. Um, so the intuition here is the following. Um, if black holes are thermodynamical systems, uh, then just as with other thermodynamical systems, uh, black holes should have a st statistical mechanical description too. Right? We should be able to assign to them, uh, for instance, a, a Boltzmann entropy, um, a statistical mechanical entropy, uh, uh, given in terms of the number of possible microstates they can be in. Um, and if we use the beckenstein hawken black hole uh, formula for uh, 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 black hole entropy um, in this expression, then we get an expression for the number of potent, uh, possible microstates of a black hole uh, as a function of the area of its event horizon. And evidence for this formula comes from calculations in effective field theory, string theory, and indeed ADS-CFT. Um, so that's the beckenstein hawken black hole entropy formula, right? So it relates a concept of entropy on the left, either thermodynamic entropy or statistical mechanical entropy uh, with uh, a spatiotemporal construction on the right, right? Namely area of uh, event horizon of a black hole. <clears throat> um, the second ancestor of the RT formula uh, is this expression. Uh, this is referred to by some authors as geometric entanglement entropy. Um, and it's the entanglement entropy for uh, a quantum field theory uh, uh, defined on a background spacetime. Right? So the idea is we uh, identify uh, two regions of the spacetime, a region R and its complement separated by the boundary of R. Um, and then we decompose our quantum field uh, into degrees of freedom localized in R and degrees of freedom localized in its complement, and then calculate the entanglement entropy of the degrees of freedom uh, localized in R. Um, and it turns out we get an expression <clears throat> that's uh, proportional to the area of uh, the boundary of the region R, del R. Um, and this formula was derived by Srednicki in a 1993 article in which he calculates the entanglement entropy of the ground state of a free massless scalar quantum field with respect to a spherical region R of spacetime. And he shows that it's proportional to the area of the boundary of R. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and to motivate this area formula, um, he makes the following statement, um, which I interpret as a thermodynamical motivation. Right? So he says, uh, entropy is usually an extensive quantity. So I assume he's referring to a thermodynamic entropy in this context. Um, so we might expect uh, the entanglement entropy S sub R to be proportional to the radius, uh, to the volume of the uh, uh, region R. Uh, but uh, he then goes on to say, well, uh, SR, in this case, SR equals SR bar. And he takes this to mean that SR should depend only on properties which are shared by the two regions. And the, and the one feature they have in common is their shared boundary. Um, so assumingly, uh, uh, by assuming SR equals SR bar, uh, I think that's equivalent to the assumption that the uh, state of the quantum field is a pure state, of the, of the vacuum state is a pure state. Um, now, in, in another article uh, 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 around this time, uh, Kaylin and Wilczek derive uh, uh, essentially the, uh, the same formula um, uh, and, and their derivation, what they, uh, uh, they derived this, uh, the entanglement entropy of the ground state of a free scalar field uh, with respect to a conical region of Euclidean spacetime. And they show that it's identical to the statistical uh, mechanical entropy of a Euclidean black hole. <clears throat> um, and there's this method uh, uh, of calculating the entanglement entropy of uh, of a quantum field that they introduce in this article that's come to be called the replica trick. Um, and I take it uh, they're motivated here by statistical mechanical motivations um, insofar as uh, uh, the form of, uh, uh, of uh, the formula for the uh, entropy of the black hole that they derive uh, 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 assumes that it's, it, 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 it's, it's statistical mechanical in nature. Um, so they claim that uh, the the uh, statistical mechanical black hole entropy and the geometric uh, entanglement entropy are the classical and first quantum contributions to a unified object measuring the response of the Euclidean path integral to the introduction of a conical singularity in, in the underlying geometry. <clears throat> um, now, one feature of entanglement entropy in the quantum field theory context uh, is uh, this UV divergent nature. Um, so most authors uh, 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 argue that uh, entanglement entropy in quantum field theory is divergent uh, uh, in the UV limit. Um, and this is demonstrated by, argued for by a number of different, in a number of different ways. Uh, so uh, there are authors who, 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 sh show this divergent uh, nature uh, by means of explicit calculations. Um, and this goes back uh, to this uh, influential article by Ed Hooft in 1985, where he, uh, uh, among other things, he shows that the free energy for a scalar field in a background black hole spacetime uh, diverges as the, as the event horizon is approached. Um, and if the free energy diverges, uh, so does other quantities derive from the free energy like the entropy. Um, and in Srednicki's derivation, uh, uh, he only gets this result uh, by inserting a cutoff into uh, uh, his, his field theory. So the form he, he derives involves a, uh, involves a cutoff. Um, and in the derivation of Kalin and Wiltzik, there's a divergence associated with the conical singularity. <clears throat> um, now, other ways of demonstrating this UV divergent nature um, and include uh, lattice theoretic estimates. So in uh, uh, his series of lectures uh, on uh, entanglement entropy, um, Hedrick uh, uh, derives this uh, 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 estimate of the entanglement entropy of, of a quantum field theory in a lattice, um, which is inversely proportional to the lattice spacing, right? And so as the lattice spacing goes to zero, you get this divergence. Um, now, yet other authors appeal explicitly to the infinite degrees of freedom of a quantum field theory. So von Ramstank 
uh, in uh, his lectures on gravity and entanglement uh, states that the, uh, the subsystem we were talking about actually consists contains an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Since we have field modes with arbitrary short wavelengths, and then summon the contribution to the entanglement entropy with respect to this region R from these infinite numbers of modes, we obtain a divergence uh, proportional to the area of the boundary. And Hartman in his lectures on uh, quantum gravity and black holes makes a similar statement. Um, in a continuum quantum field theory, there are UV modes at arbitrarily small scales across the dividing surface. And this makes it impossible to actually split the full Hilbert space. And so here he's referring to the uh, infinite number of degrees of freedom of a quantum field theory uh, as an obstacle uh, to a simplistic uh, bipartition of its Hilbert space into two factor spaces. Um, and this latter statement of Hart Hartman's, uh, I take it can be made rigorous and uh, more rigorous formulations of quantum field theory. Um, so this is the last way of perhaps demonstrating the UV divergent nature of, of quantum field theoretic entanglement entropy. Um, so here uh, we're appealing explicitly to this non-type one nature of the algebra of observables that appear in quantum field theories. Right? This is the warning that Ehrman gave us a while back. Um, so in an article from 2020, Noel Swanson uh, demonstrates this following what he calls a no-go lemma in the context of the algebraic approach to quantum field theory. Um, so any model of the hog Kessler axioms with a well-defined UV scaling limit. If the local double cone algebras are not of the simple type one, uh, then there are, there's no pair of Hilbert spaces and an isomorphism from our state space of our theory to the product of these two Hilbert spaces uh, such that uh, we can, re essentially we can re represent the, uh, the operators associated with any double cone region um, and uh, the complement of the double cone region in terms of uh, operators only confined to one of these two uh, uh, Hilbert spaces. Um, so here's a rigorous way of, of stating this claim that uh, in quantum field theory, you can't uh, uh, naively split the Hilbert space into, into factor spaces. Um, and Swanson goes on to point out that that this obstacle is not a consequence of the riesz schleder theorem, um, which is another result in right, algebraic quantum field theory that, that indicates, in particular, the vacuum of a typical uh, quantum field theory is uh, and, uh, generically uh, is entangled across any generic uh, space-like separated regions. Uh, but this UV divergent nature is is, is not a con not a consequence of the, of this of the riesz theorem, um, right? Uh, or a consequence of this type, this non-type one nature of of the algebra observables in, in QFT. Um, all right, so that's the concept of geometric entanglement entropy. So now we have a formula that relates entanglement entropy on the left to uh, a geometric construction on the right. <clears throat> um, and the last uh, ancestor of the RT formula I'd like to review is uh, this extension of uh, geometric entanglement entropy to what's called uh, topological entanglement entropy, um, which includes uh, a, a second term on the right. right? Um, and this second, topological term uh, was introduced independently in two articles in 2006 uh, by Levine and Wynn um, and Katev and Preskill. Um, so their intuition is the following, right? The formula for geometric entanglement entropy uh, 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 encodes kind of a geometric aspect of entanglement entropy, uh, seemingly in the form of local short range correlations. Um, and uh, Levine and Wynn and Kitave and Preskill uh, suggest uh, uh, we also need, in addition, um, a term representing a topological aspect uh, of entanglement entropy, a topological contribution uh, to entanglement entropy, 
that uh, encodes perhaps non-local global long range correlations. Um, and this seems, this is the intuition of Levine and Wynn, right? They suggest that a non-zero value of this gamma term, uh, quote, signals the presence of non-local correlations. Um, and what they go on to characterize as topological order. <clears throat> um, so the motivation for this claim, for this intuition, uh, is uh, the following example uh, due to Levine and Wynn. So they ask us to consider uh, four regions of space. Um, and a similar ar argument is given in Kateva Preskill's article, but they use uh, a different configuration of, of regions. Um, so in Levine and Wynn's example, uh, we have these four different regions of space. Uh, these are the, the red regions, A, B, C, and D, um, with B uh, uh, being identical to A, except for the fact that B is missing the top bar uh, that A has. And similarly, C is identical to A, except for a missing bottom bar. And D consists of two disjoint regions. It's just missing the top and bottom bars of A. Um, and each of these regions, A, B, C, and D, uh, divide the space into uh, a red region and its complement separated by a boundary. Right? Uh, in the A region case, uh, A has two boundaries, del A1 and del A2. Similarly, in the D region, in the D example, and in the B and C examples, um, there's just a single boundary. Right? And Levine and Wynn now suggest, uh, now, now ask us to focus on this particular combination of entanglement entropies associated with these four regions. In particular, uh, they ask us to calculate the difference uh, between the differences of SA minus SB and SC minus SD. Right? SA is the entanglement entropy of a subsystem localized in region A with respect to a subsystem localized in its complement. And similarly for SB, SC, and SD. Um, and they observe that, well, if we use the formula for geometric entanglement entropy without the second topological term um, uh, uh, and calculate this, this difference, uh, we get zero, right? So let's see, the idea is as follows. Um, the entanglement entropy S sub A uh, is given by the sum of the areas of the bounded surfaces, right? The sum of the area of sum of the uh, area of del A1 plus the area del A2. Right? In the two-dimensional case, it's just the length of the perimeters of uh, del A1 and del A2. Um, similarly, the entanglement entropy S sub B is uh, uh, the length of the perimeter del B. And the difference in these lengths, uh, length of del A1 plus length of del A2 minus length of del B uh, is equal to what the length of this section of del A2 plus the, the length of the section immediately above it. Right? That's what's missing in, in, in the B configuration. Um, and similarly, uh, the difference it between SC and SD uh, is given by the sum of this section of del C plus the sum of the section immediately above it. Right? That's what's missing uh, in D with respect to C. And that's the same uh, uh, quantity as, as what we derived, what we calculated, uh, uh, what, what SA minus SB is equal to. And so the difference between these two quantities uh, vanishes. Um, so the intuition here is uh, Levine and Wynn's intuition then is um, any non-zero difference uh, uh, um, in this quantity uh, can only arise uh, from a topological contribution to entanglement entropy, a contribution perhaps from an operator uh, 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 that ha can have support on A that cannot have support on C, for instance, right? If such an operator contributes to the entanglement entropy of S sub A, 
it would not contribute to the entangled entropy S, S sub C. <clears throat> um, and a non-zero value of gamma is supposed to indicate the presence of a correlation associated with such a, a what we might call a non-local operator. Um, so to make this maybe a bit more concrete, uh, let's consider uh, uh, how we might make a distinction between local and non-local correlations. Um, so here's the uh, A region once again. Um, and in this diagram, I've also uh, represented uh, three subregions. Right? One is the non-contractible loop C that extends all the way around region A, right? non-contractible in the sense that it cannot be continuously deformed into a point. Um, and then there's a region Y contained in A that consists of a contractible uh, uh, region of points. And similarly, there's a region X uh, in the complement of A that's also a contractible region, a contractible set, uh, perhaps of lattice sites. Um, and then we can identify operators that have support on these three regions. Right? So an operator that only has support on the C region, uh, we might think of as a non-local operator, right? only in the sense that it only has, by definition, uh, we might define it as only having support on C uh, and be in the identity on, say, all lattice, point, lattice sites that aren't contained in C. Um, a Wilson loop operator has, has, has those features. Um, and operators with, with supports on contractible sets, uh, Y and X, we might identify, we might refer to as lo local operators. Local here only in the sense that, again, they have support on contractible regions of a given space. Um, with that distinction, we then might make this distinction between a non-local correlation uh, 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 in terms of a correlation uh, in which at least one of the uh, observables, uh, correlated observables is a non-local operator. Um, and a local correlation might be identified as a correlation in which all observables are local. <clears throat> um, and this seems to be the intuition under uh, of Levin and Wynn, right? So, so here's, uh, uh, one way that uh, their uh, uh, example has been characterized. So this is uh, a, an account of Levin and Wynn's uh, example uh, uh, by Patros in his uh, text on uh, topological quantum computation. Uh, so here he says uh, the difference in, in, in Levin and Wynn's example, the difference SA minus SB has contributions that come from the upper horizontal part of the region A, right? Uh, similarly, non-zero contributions to SC minus SD also come from the same upper part. Um, if these entropies only had contributions from local correlations, um, if we only used uh, the, the formula for geometric entanglement entropy uh, to, calculate, to calculate them, uh, then their difference would go to zero, right? as, we, uh, as we discussed on the previous slide, uh, when their respective regions become sufficiently large. Uh, the only possible contribution could arise from a non-local operator, uh, like a Wilson loop operator that wraps non-trivially around the region A. So again, the, the intuition is that uh, a non-zero value of this second term in this formula for entanglement entropy uh, indicates the presence of a non-local correlation contributing to the left-hand side. Um, and that non-local Correlation uh, is due, according to Levin and Wynn's and Patros's uh, intuition, uh, 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 is due to uh, the presence of a, of a non local operator of the Wilson loop uh, variety. Um, okay, so that's the concept of topological entanglement entropy. Right? So, again, to step back, uh, it's another formula that relates entanglement entropy on the left-hand side uh, to, in this case, geometrical and topological features of a space or space-time on the right. <clears throat> um, so 
that summarizes one, uh, one may ask something a moment the, the yes. gamma that appeared here in, in the formula about topological entropy is connected with the earlier characteristic i'm sorry it's connected with Euler characteristic. Oh, oh, uh, uh, no, I don't think so. No, uh, okay. I think it's just the same, the same symbol. <laughs> uh, ah, it's symbol, not there, no connection. Okay. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Actually, uh, the symbol I think that Levine and Wynn use is a lowercase gamma, uh, but I thought I would use a capital I'm gamma. Connected with the number of the whole holes of uh, of the the system. No, it's not connected. It is is. Uh... Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not associated with the Euler characters. Okay. Okay. No. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, okay. Um, so that's uh, topological entanglement entropy. Um, so with these examples in hand, uh, uh, let's now move uh, on to uh, part three of the lecture. Uh, let, let's now consider the RT formula um, in its uh, full-blown glory. Um, and then I'd like to uh, uh, discuss uh, one proposed interpretation of it uh, on Romstonk's, what I call von Romstonk's uh, connectedness entanglement hypothesis. Um, so here's the RT formula as originally uh, presented in Ryu and Takayanagi's paper in 2006. Um, again, it relates, and, uh, so this is, uh, it's, it's given in the context of ads -CFT, right? Um, and in that context, uh, we need these particular constructions uh, in order to state the RT formula. So we have uh, a spatial slice through the bulk um, intersecting the boundary in some boundary spatial surface. Um, and we've decomposed that boundary spatial surface into a subregion R and its complement R bar. Um, with respect to R, we define this bulk surface called the minimal area bulk surface associated with R. Right? It's the bulk surface that has the same boundary as R, um, and it's the minimal area such bulk surface. Um, and in addition, there's this other bulk surface, uh, the homology surface H sub R, uh, that's defined as the surface whose boundary is the union of R, the bulk surface whose boundary is the union of R and gamma R. Um, so the RT formula as originally stated by Ryu and Takayanagi uh, is the statement that the entanglement entropy of a boundary subsystem localized on R uh, is equal to the area of the corresponding minimal area bulk surface gamma R. Uh, divided by four times the Newtonian gap gravitational constant. <clears throat> um, so here again, we have another formula expressing a relationship between entanglement entropy on the left and spatial some spatial temporal construction on the right, right. But in this case, the formula is given in the context of ADS CFT. Um, motivations. For the formula, uh, well, recall that you know it, formally it, it's very similar to the three previous formula we've just discussed, it's the three ancestors. Um, but here are some additional motivations. Um, so one is uh, an analogy with the Bekenstein-Hawken black hole entropy formula, um, and I think this is given in, in the original article by Ryu and Takayanagi. Uh, so they suggest, uh, well, in the particular case in which the bulk spacetime is ADS Schwarzschild spacetime or asymptotically approaches ADS Schwarzschild spacetime, um, that's an example of a black hole spacetime. So we have a black hole in the bulk um, in the limit in which our boundary spatial subregion R encompasses the entire boundary time slice, um, the corresponding minimal area bulk surface gamma sub R uh, intuitively wraps around the event horizon of the bulk black hole and becomes the event horizon right, in this limit. Um, 
Um, and in fact, right, uh, and that limit, uh, when gamma sub r can be identified as the event horizon of a black hole, we, we get the beckenstein hawken formula, right? Um, at least if we identify the entanglement entropy S sub r with, with, black, with, with either thermodynamic entropy or statistical mechanical entropy. Um, so that's one sort of intuitive motivation for the RT formula. Um, and, and then the RT formula itself then would just be a generalization uh, uh, to the case in which the bulk spacetime isn't necessarily a black hole spacetime. Um, alternatively, uh, perhaps a more rigorous motivation uh, uh, comes in the form of uh, an explicit derivation of the RT formula. Um, and this was given in an article by Lukowitz and Maldacena in 2013, in which they uh, derive an expression for the RT formula uh, using Euclidean path integral techniques. Um, and I think the method they use really uh, imitates the method used originally by Kalin and Wiltzik in their uh, derivation of geometric entanglement entropy. <clears throat> um, so at least two motivations for, for the particular form of the original RT formula. Um, here are some qualifications uh, uh, um, for uh, the formula, at least in its original form. Um, so it holds in cases in which the bulk theory is a classical theory of gravity that satisfies the Einstein equations uh, with a time reflection symmetry under which R is invariant. Um, I take it the time reflection symmetry is required in order to be able to identify um, a, a boundary spatial, a time slice, right, with respect to which we can then identify R and then these corresponding constructions in the bulk. But uh, that assumption can be relaxed. The time reflection symmetry assumption can be relaxed um, and a covariant version of the RT formula uh, can be formulated. Um, uh, and this was uh, given in an article by uh, Hubini and uh, colleagues. And moreover, uh, an additional term on the right-hand side of the equation can be added uh, uh, what's called a quantum correction uh, term. Uh, that uh, uh, roughly represents uh, uh, the uh, degree, uh, the entanglement entropy of a bulk system with respect to uh, uh, H sub R, uh, degrees of freedom uh, supported on H sub R. <clears throat> um, and this quantum correction was, was argued, was derived in, in this article by Faulkner and colleagues in 2013. Um, all right, so that's the RT formula, right? And, and some motivations for it um, and uh, some, some slight extensions of it. Um, what does, how, how do we understand it, right? In, in the first instance, uh, uh, we might attempt to understand it as an additional entry in the ADS-CFT dictionary, right? It's related a quantity on the bulk, a quantity on the boundary, the entanglement entropy, um, associated with the boundary composite system uh, with a bulk quantity, right? The uh, uh, area of a minimal area bulk surface correspondent to uh, R. Um, now, von Ramsdonk uh, uh, has suggested uh, the following interpretation of the RT formula, at least in its original form. Um, so call this the connectedness entanglement hypothesis. Um, so here's the RT formula in its original form um, without the quantum correction term in particular, right? So von, von Ramsdonk's intuition was, um, well, it's supposed to represent the entanglement entropy uh, of a bipartite physical system on the boundary, right? With respect to some decomposition of degrees of freedom into uh, um, those supported on some region R and, and those supported on its complement. Um, so assumedly uh, the physical system uh, uh, on the boundary uh, is in some entangled state uh, with respect to this particular decomposition. So here's a generic entangled state, bipartite entangled state, uh, entangled in, in the sense of non-product state. Um, 
in the context of a, of a vector state as opposed to a density operator state. Um, so here's uh, an entangled state uh, that might represent a state of a composite uh, a system on the boundary. Um, with respect to this state, we can, we can calculate uh, uh, the entanglement entropy of the subsystem localized on R, right? Um, in terms of the R key formula. Um, and as the entanglement entropy of R goes to zero, according to von Ramsdank's intuition, we would expect uh, this initial entangled boundary state to become disentangled. Ultimately, when SR is equal to zero, um, the state of the composite system on the boundary becomes a product state um, involving degrees of freedom localized in R and degrees of freedom localized in its boundary uh, without any correlation between observables associated with these two states. Um, and now if we apply the ADS-CFT correspondence, if we interpret the RT formula as a statement of one aspect of the ADS-CFT correspondence, right? the initial entangled uh, boundary state is dual to uh, some uh, uh, geometric configuration in the bulk, right? Uh, associated with uh, um, a minimal area bulk surface, gamma sub r, uh, that serves to divide the bulk spacetime, or at least this spatial slice of the bulk spacetime into two separate regions, hr and hr bar. Um, and in the limit as sr on the left goes to zero, uh, the area of gamma sub r on the right should also go to zero. And if the area of gamma sub r on the right goes to zero, uh, that effectively pinches off the bulk spatial slice into two disconnected regions, right? HR and HR bar. Um, and Van, Ram Van Ramstonk's intuition is that um, uh, this bulk configuration, spatial, spatial, spatial temporal configuration, spatial configuration corresponds on the boundary to this product state. Um, and now von Ram, von Ramstonk asks us to consider the reverse process, right? In which uh, we begin in the bulk with two disconnected regions um, and then increase the area of this minimal area surface separating them. And in this process, uh, two disconnected regions become a connected region. Um, uh, and that process corresponds to uh, the entanglement uh, of two subsystems on the boundary. <clears throat> So according to von Ramstonk, classical connectivity in the bulk arises by entangling the degrees of freedom of the two components of a CFT product state on the boundary. <clears throat> so does that make sense? So again, right, the idea is uh, spatio-temporal connect connectivity in the bulk is dual to entanglement on the boundary. <clears throat> Um, now, one question, one potential concern with this connectedness entanglement hypothesis uh, involves uh, uh, um, the extension of the R key formula, right? So in its covariant uh, uh, version with the quantum correction term included, uh, can we still maintain this connectedness entanglement hypothesis? <clears throat> Um, right, so it looks like, uh, uh, so here's the, uh, the RT formula with the quantum correction term, right? the second term on the right. Um, this seems to spoil the duality between uh, entanglement on the boundary on the left and connectedness slash topology in the bulk on the right, right? Uh, now entanglement on the boundary is no longer defined simply in terms of connectivity in the bulk. It also is defined in terms of an additional component involving entanglement in the boundary. Um, so now, uh, you know, whereas initially we might interpret this as a duality relation um, with the quantum correction term added, uh, that seems to be no longer the case. Um, and at this point, uh, uh, I'd like to consider a proposal due to uh, Susskind uh, in an article in 2016 in which uh, uh, he suggests a, a way to 
essentially reestablish a duality, uh, a duality understanding of the RT formula uh, uh, supplemented by this quantum correction term. Um, and this proposal is motivated uh, by uh, an earlier uh, conjecture due to uh, Maldacena and Susskind uh, called the ER equals EPR hypothesis, uh, uh, which I'll discuss in a bit more detail in, in, in later lectures later this week. Right At this point, uh, uh, it's the hypothesis uh, that uh, two subsystems of a composite system in an entangled state um, are connected by a Einstein-Rosen wormhole. <clears throat> um, so in this 2016 article, Susskind applies this hypothesis to uh, the RT formula with quantum correction. Right? So he suggests, well, this quantum correction term right, uh, uh, can be interpreted again as uh, the entanglement entropy of a, sub, of, of a bulk subsystem localized in some region X in the HR part of the bulk uh, with respect to some subsystem localized in some region Y in the HR bar region. Um, it encodes the entanglement of subsystems localized in regions X and Y in the bulk, right? Um, and his proposal then is under the ER equals EPR hypothesis, if the subsystem at X is entangled with the subsystem at Y, then there's a wormhole that connects them in the bulk. Um, and in addition, uh, the measure uh, of the wormhole that corresponds to the measure of entanglement between the two bulk systems, uh, uh, Suscom assumes to be uh, the minimal area cross-section of this wormhole that connects them. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about this proposal of uh, identifying the minimal area cross-section of a wormhole as the, quant the measure of a wormhole that kind of corresponds to the measure of entanglement uh, uh, represented by entanglement entropy um, in, 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 in my lectures on the ER equals EPR course uh, hypothesis uh, later on this week. Um, but Susskind adopts this proposal, right? Um, and so under, un, under his ER equals EPR modified RT formula, uh, we can replace the second quantum correction term, which is a term that involve in entanglement uh, with a term involved in spatial, uh, 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 some feature of space-time geometry, right? In this case, namely the minimal area cross-section uh, of a wormhole in the bulk. Um, so this seems to reestablish uh, a duality relation uh, 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 that we can uh, associate with the RT formula, right? Um, under the original RT formula, uh, the connectedness entanglement hypothesis, von Ramstonk's connectedness entanglement hypothesis only suggests that uh, boundary entanglement is necessary but not sufficient for bulk connectedness. Um, Susskind's ER equals EPR modified interpretation of the RT formula uh, uh, reestablishes sort of this bi uh, uh, biconditional one to one relation between bulk connectedness and boundary entanglement. <clears throat> Um, okay. Um, uh, it, uh, any questions at this point? So this is uh, the RT formula with quantum correction term added and one proposal as to how to maintain that it states a duality, an ADS-CFT duality relation. Um, but in order to do so, uh, we have to adopt this other hypothesis, the ER equals CPR hypothesis. Um, all right. So that's the RT formula and one sense in which it states a duality uh, between uh, quantities on the boundary and quantities in the bulk uh, in ADS-CFT. Um, now I'd like, in, in the last part of the lecture, I'd like to step back and consider in general what it takes to establish, what it should take, what it could take to establish a duality between topology on the one hand and quantum entanglement on the other. 
and I'd like to approach this uh, this question uh, in terms of two approaches, uh, a state-based approach and an observable-based approach. Um, so let's first consider uh, what we might call state-based approaches to a duality relation between topology and quantum entanglement. Um, so the intuition here is that the goal of a state-based approach is to identify topological states that can be thought of as dual to quantum entangled states. <clears throat> um, and uh, as an initial example of such an approach, um, I'd like to consider um, uh, what uh, uh, some authors refer to as Aravind's analogy. Um, and this is an example uh, given in an article by Aravind from 97. Um, according to his analogy, um, topologically entangled in links are analogous to quantum entangled in partite states. Um, and then, of course, the relevant question is, uh, can we make this, can we turn this analogy into a duality relation? Um, so uh, his, his intuition, Ervin's intuition was the following. Um, well, in topology, an in-link is an embedding of a disjoint collection of in-circles uh, up to continuous deformation, up to ambient iso isotopy. Um, so as, an, as a first example, Aravind asks us to consider uh, this particular three-link, this embedding of three circles um, uh, known as the Borromean rings three-link, right? So it has the feature that all three circles are intertwined with each other, entangled with each other um, in such a way that if you cut any one of these circles, uh, the other two circles become disentangled, right? And Aravind suggests this is analogous to this particular tripartite non-product vector state. Right? Uh, this is uh, one form of a GSC tripartite uh, non-product vector state. state. Um, uh, so the idea here is if we measure one of these three subsystems, uh, so, so, so this is a state in, uh, uh, involving three subsystems uh, um, in spin states. So if we measure subsystem one, for instance, um, and get the results spin up, uh, then the other two subsystems become disentangled, right? Uh, the state of our, of our composite system uh, becomes a product state, um, assuming we adopt the uh, projection postulate. Right? And so according to Aravind, uh, measurement of, um, uh, of a multipartite vector state in quantum mechanics is kind of the analogy of cutting uh, a link in an in-link. <clears throat> um, now, uh, to, to make this analogy maybe a bit more rigorous, uh, to strengthen it, uh, let's recall uh, some, some definitions from topology. Um, so let's recall uh, that the n-dimensional braid group, B sub n, uh, is the group uh, generated uh, by uh, um, n generators little sigma that satisfy two conditions that are referred to as the, uh, uh, I think they're called the Braden conditions, the Braden relations. Um, and the intended interpretation of these generators is that they act on objects called in strands, um, vertical line segments, right? Such that the action of the ith generator sigma sub i uh, on the ith strand uh, is to uh, 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 twist it, um, I guess, counterclockwise about the i plus one strand. And the action of the inverse of the ith generator is to reverse that, to twist the ith stand clockwise about the i plus one stand, strand. Um, so an in braid uh, given by a sequence of uh, generators of the of the braid group uh, uh, can be thought of as a set of n strands that carries a representation of the braid group. <clears throat> um, now uh, it turns out that every n link can be represented by a closed n braid. <clears throat> um, I think this is due to a theorem by Alexander. 
Um, so for instance, uh, we can get the Borromean rings three link by taking the closure of this particular three braid, right? identifying uh, uh, the endpoints of the first strand and the endpoints of the second strand and the endpoints of the third strand. Um, and in doing so, we get, we get this closed uh, three link. And similarly, the trivial two link consisting of two disconnected circles uh, can be represented by the closure of this uh, 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 two braid, right, given by sigma one times its inverse. Um, now this suggests the following definition. Um, an in braid uh, can be thought of as topologically entangled just when it contains at least one pairwise set of terms sigma i, sigma j, uh, that are not uh, 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 equal to the identity, <clears throat> right? Um, so uh, the three braid whose closure uh, produces the Borromean rings uh, three link, which is entangled, uh, can be, uh, is topologically entangled according to this definition, whereas the two braid that produces the trivial two link uh, is not topologically entangled. Um, so this finally allows us to define uh, uh, the concept of a topologically entangled in braid. Um, let's let an in braid uh, be topologically entangled just when it's the closure of a topologically entangled in braid. Sorry, in link is topologically entangled. Um, and it's this definition now that we can compare with um, the definition of a quantum entangled vector state right, uh, as a non-product state. Um, so now we can formulate this question. Are topologically entangled in-links the dual of quantum entangled in partite states? <clears throat> um, and the answer to this question is alas, no. Um, and this was demonstrated again in this article by Aravin. So he gives counterexamples to this claim uh, uh, in the following two types, of the following two types. Um, it turns out a topologically entangled in link uh, can correspond um, to more, to many distinct quantum entangled in partite states. <clears throat> um, uh, so his example is, uh, um, this family of uh, quantum entangled tripartite states, um, right? It's a family because uh, uh, um, you get any, any particular uh, uh, entangled tripartite state by uh, some particular value of alpha and beta, or by choosing some particular uh, direction for, for the spin axes. Uh, but according to Aravin, this family of, of entangled states corresponds to just a single, uh, um, what we call the uh, topologically entangled three link. Uh, in this case, this is what's called the three Hopf rings uh, three link. So this has the feature that if we cut one of the circles, uh, the other two remain entangled with each other. And that corresponds to in the entangled state, uh, um, measuring one of the three subsystems. Suppose we measure subsystem one um, and we get the results spin up. Um, the composite state collapses to the first term, right? And that's a term in which the two other systems remain entangled. Um, and uh, the other counterexample Aravin discusses or, or uh, mentions is, uh, uh, this one, a quantum entangled in partite state, turns out may not correspond to a definite topologically entangled in-link, right? So here's a particular example of a tripartite entangled quantum state. And according to Aravind's intuition, um, it corresponds to either the three hop rings, uh, topologically entangled three link, or the Borromean rings, topologically entangled three link. Um, each with a given probability, right? So if we measure subsystem one, there's a probability of a third that the two other subsystems become disentangled, right? And that corresponds to the Borromean rings uh, three link. Um, if we measure subsystem one 
um, then there's a probability of two thirds uh, that it, uh, uh, we get the result spin up, right? And in that case, uh, the two other subsystems remain entangled. And that seems to correspond to, again, the, the three hop rings, three link. So according to Aravind, um, this single tripartite entangled state corresponds with a probability of a third to the Brumian rings three link and a probability of two thirds to the, to the three hop rings three link. So there's no simple uh, uh, duality relation uh, between topologically entangled in links on the one hand and uh, quantum entangled in partite states on the other. Um, that isn't to say, you know, such a duality can be established in an alternative state-based approach, but it is to uh, suggest that uh, any attempt uh, um, uh, uh, is potentially problematic. Um, so let's let, let me move on now to an alternative approach to attempting to establish a duality between topology and entanglement, um, and let's call this one an observable-based approach. Um, the intuition here is that the goal is to find suitable dual notions of quantum entanglement observable and topological observable. Um, and an example of this approach uh, is given uh, uh, by a research program that was initiated by uh, Kaufman and Lomonaco in 2002. Um, and a fairly recent uh, review and update of that program is given in this article from 2016 by Elagic and, and colleagues. Um, so Kaufman and Lomonoko's idea was uh, to focus on unitary representations of the braid group. <clears throat> um, so a unitary representation of the braid group is a map uh, from generators of the braid group, a little sigmas on the one hand to uh, um, uh, impartite operators that act on an impartite vector space, on the other hand. Um, impartite operators of a particular form, uh, namely under this, under a unitary representation, uh, the kth generator is mapped to uh, this impartite operator that is the identity on all uh, degrees of freedom, lattice if you will, uh, except for the kth and k plus one sites on which it acts like uh, what's called a Yang-Baxter operator. Um, and a Yang-Baxter operator is a bipartite operator uh, that satisfies this particular relation. Uh, so the intuition here is that this relation uh, uh, encodes the Braden relations that define uh, the generators of the Braid group. So this is sort of the operator theoretic version of the Braden relations. Um, so the idea uh, here is that each inbraid uh, corresponds under a unitary representation to an inpartite operator on some vector space. Um, and then we can ask, oh, and, and uh, uh, then we might define an inpartite operator on a vector space, an inpartite vector space, to be quantum entangling uh, just when there's a product vector in our space such that when we operate on it with our operator, O, we get a non-product vector. Um, so now we can formulate the following question. Um, is a unitary representation of a given N braid B quantum entangling if and only if the N braid is topologically entangled? If the answer to this is yes, then this is a way of establishing a duality right, between uh, topological observables and uh, quantum entanglement observables. But the answer to this question turns out is again, no. Um, and uh, uh, Taufman and Lomonoko demonstrate this by a particular realization of a Yang-Baxter operator. So this is a Yang-Baxter operator defined on um, two copies of uh, uh, two-dimensional complex space. Um, and they show that it's not quantum entanglement just when uh, uh, alpha beta, alpha times beta equals 
delta times gamma, right? where alpha, beta, delta, gamma are the, the non-zero entries in this matrix representation of it. Um, and this entails that uh, if B is a topologically entangled two braid, uh, then a unitary representation of it is not quantum entangling for right, these values of uh, the matrix elements of the matrix, rep matrix representation of the unitary representation. Um, but you know, on, on the other hand, this is, shouldn't be all that surprising given uh, Aravind's analysis. Right? So we already knew topologically entangled closed braids as topological states are not dual to non-product vector states. <clears throat> um, so perhaps we just haven't uh, identified the proper types of topological observables. Um, so another potential candidate uh, for a topological observable uh, might be what are called what, what's called a link invariant, right? Uh, this is just a function, um, uh, a function that takes values on links. Uh, uh, um, that is the same for uh, 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 isotopically equivalent links. <clears throat> um, now, to define uh, an appropriate link invariant um, in terms of a yang baxter operator. It turns out requires uh, this slight extension of a Yang-Baxter operator to what's called an enhanced Yang-Baxter operator. Um, this being a pair uh, uh, where one item is a Yang-Baxter operator and the other object in the pair is um, some arbitrary uh, map from uh, the vector space V to itself um, and endomorphism on V. Uh, that has uh, such that uh, R and mu are related in, in, in these two ways. Um, so this just guarantees uh, that uh, um, uh, the Yang-Baxter operator uh, is invariant on uh, uh, another set of operations you can perform on uh, uh, in braids uh, that, leave, uh, that leave them invariant. I think uh, uh, the set of operations is called the Markov uh, transformations. Um, so uh, given this definition of an enhanced Yang Baxter operator, we can then uh, define a link invariant uh, roughly as the trace of a unitary representation of, a, of an N braid, right? supplemented by this, by this endomorphism thing. <clears throat> um, now, uh, we can then modify the, the last question. We can now ask, um, is a unitary representation of an N braid quantum entanglement if and only if this corresponding link invariant uh, on, on B is non-trivial? Um, and even this more rigorous attempt to understand duality between topological and quantum entanglement observables uh, turns out fails. <clears throat> Uh, and this was demonstrated uh, in uh, this review article by Elagic and, and colleagues in 2016. Um, so they showed that uh, given an enhanced Yang-Baxter operator, um, it is non-entangling. If it's non-entangling, then the corresponding link invariant is constant and hence trivial on closed in braids. Right. So in other words, um, quantum entangling of an enhanced Yang Baxter operator is necessary, but not sufficient for a non trivial link invariant. <clears throat> um, so, again, our attempt to establish a one to one correspondence, a duality relation between um, quantum, entang uh, quantum entanglement ob observables and, and topological, topological observables fails. Um, so, maybe we have not identified the appropriate quantum entanglement observables, or maybe we have not yet identified the appropriate topological entanglement observables. <clears throat> um, so at this point, let me step back um, and consider uh, a couple of very general questions. Um, you know, in particular, if we think we haven't identified the appropriate quantum entanglement observable, we might at this point step back and ask ourselves exactly what is a quantum entanglement observable that could possibly be dual to a topological observable. Um, and uh, we should be aware that the answer to this question uh, uh, can take one of two forms. 
Um, so one way to answer this question uh, uh, is in terms of an observable, observable that violates an entropic inequality. Um, so for a bipartite state, uh, density operator state rho sub AB, an entropic inequality takes this general form uh, S sub alpha uh, rho A less than or equal to S sub alpha rho AB, where S sub alpha of, a, of rho is what's called the alpha Rinyi entropy associated with uh, density operator rho. Um, think of it as a kind of a generalization of entanglement entropy. Um, you get uh, von Neumann entropy as uh, the limit, I think, as alpha goes to one of uh, the alpha Rinyi entropies. Um, and in that, in, in that limit, you, you get that inequality between um, entanglement entropy on the left and uh, von Neumann entropy on the right uh, that appeared in a previous slide. <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, a quantum entanglement observable might be defined in terms of an observable that violates an entropic in in inequality of this general form. Alternatively, you might claim a quantum entanglement observable is one that violates a Bell inequality, right? So for a bipartite state rho AB, with respect to which uh, some two pairs of observables, OA, O prime A, OB, O prime B, are conditionally statistically independent, uh, then uh, the CHSH version of a Bell inequality can be shown to take this fairly succinct form. Um, it's the absolute value of the trace of a particular operator, script B, with uh, uh, our uh, bipartite density operator state. Um, and the condition is that, it, that that's less than or equal to two, um, where the, uh, uh, the Bell operator is given by this combination of, of the relevant observables. <clears throat> um, so uh, the general question is, right, uh, uh, um, are manifestations of entanglement in, in, in the form of ent entropic inequality violate, uh, violations uh, the same as manifesta manifestations of, of entanglement in the form of violations of a Bell inequality? And in general, I think uh, the answer to that question is, is no. Um, um, it's a non-trivial distinction. Um, so there are examples of mixed states uh, in which this distinction uh, 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 becomes non-trivial. Uh, um, um, so here's an example of a two-dimensional, what, what, what's called a two-dimensional Werner state, right? This is a mixed state in which the first term is the projection operator associated uh, with the spin singlet, uh, spin a half state, right? And then the second term uh, is just a, a, a trivial combination of identity operators, right? And, and both terms are weighted uh, appropriately by, a, uh, by a given probabilities. <clears throat> um, and it, you can show uh, the following uh, uh, properties that hold for this uh, two-dimensional Werner state. Um, and the first three, I think, are demonstrated in an article by the Horodekis from 96. Um, and the last claim is demonstrated in a, in a thesis by Kramer from 2005. Right, so uh, uh, for P less than a third, uh, rho sub W is non-separable. For P greater than one over the square root of three, uh, it violates the alpha equals two entropic inequality. For P greater than one over square root of two, it violates the CHSH Bell inequality. And for P greater than this particular value, 0.7476, it violates the alpha equals one uh, von Neumann entropic inequality, All right? So this indicates that for a certain range of values of P, um, the entanglement of this two-dimensional Werner state is detected by an entropic inequality, but not by a Bell inequality. And for another range of values of P, uh, its entanglement is detected by a Bell inequality, but not by the von Neumann entropic inequality, where uh, entanglement is defined in terms of non-separability. Um, all right, so again, that's something to 
be aware of, right? Uh, uh, if, if, if we get to the point where we want to identify a quantum, an appropriate quantum entanglement observable uh, that we want to set dual to a topological entanglement, a topological uh, observable. Um, and we can ask a similar question about uh, topological observables. Uh, what constitutes a topological entanglement observable? Um, and with respect to this question, I think there are three uh, concerns uh, uh, that we need to be aware of. Um, and the first involves uh, nonlinearity. Um, so the concern is this, uh, to the extent that quantum entanglement is characterized by an entropic inequality, um, it cannot be represented by a linear operator. Um, but typical topological observables can be represented by linear operators. Um, so the intuition here is as follows, right? Uh, uh, the nonlinearity of quantum entanglement observables is sometimes described in terms of uh, the set of entangled states not being closed under addition, right? Um, two entangled states, the sum of two entangled states might not be an entangled state. Um, so there's no linear operator that would respond yes when it acts on an entangled state um, uh, for uh, that applies to the, to, to the complete set of entangled states. Um, and on the other hand, uh, right, uh, typical examples of what we might identify as topological observables can be represented by linear operators. Um, Wilson loop op observables, um, observables associated with Arona our, our, our foam phases. Uh, so that's one concern to be aware of. Um, another concern involves non-locality, right? So to the extent that quantum entanglement is characterized by a Bell inequality, arguably uh, it is linear, at least insofar as right, a Bell inequality can be encoded as a, a, in the form of an inequality uh, 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 with respect to some linear Bell operator, the expectation value of a linear Bell operator. Um, but uh, it exhibits a non-locality that is distinct from topological non-locality. Right? Um, so uh, let's say that an observable is localizable just when it has support at or in a finite contractible neighborhood of a point. Um, let's say an observable exhibits topological non-locality just when it has support on a non-contractible region of, of a space or space time, right? So an example of a torod, uh, uh, when, when your space time or space uh, has the geometry of a torus, right? Uh, observables with support on either the two non-contractible loops uh, can be thought of as topological, uh, as exhibiting topological non-locality. Um, an observable uh, with support in a contractible region of the surface of the torus or along a contractible loop, on the other hand, satisfies localization. Um, and then we might define quantum entanglement on locality simply in terms of two observables exhibit, exhibiting a distant Bell inequality violated correlation. Um, so the intuition here is that uh, topological non locality by definition violates localization, whereas quantum entanglement non locality is consistent with localization. Right? Observables can be. Uh, can, can exhibit quantum entanglement on locality insofar as they can be, they can exhibit a quantum entangling, entanglement correlation and yet be localizable. Um, so the relevant question here is, are there circumstances in which uh, topological non-locality entails quantum, quantum entanglement non-locality? Um, so I'll, I'll leave that as an open question. Um, and then the final uh, 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 concern with identifying uh, uh, appropriate topological observables that might be dual to quantum entanglement observables uh, concerns the, uh, the concept of correlations, right? Um, in particular, can a topological observable enter into a Bell inequality correlation? Um, and in this context, uh, we might distinguish between uh, four types of correlation. Um, and this, uh, the, the first two, uh, the first distinction between one and two 
is uh, that distinction that, that was introduced on a previous slide, right? We might say a local correlation uh, involves only localizable obser obser observables, whereas a non-local correlation involves at least one non-localizable, i.e. topologically non-local observable. Um, but in addition to those two types of correlations, we might also distinguish between short range correlations that go to zero at some sufficiently large separation distance and long range correlations that do not go to zero. Um, now, quantum entanglement correlations, namely distant Bell inequality violating correlations are typically viewed as local um, and can be either short range or long range. Right? Um, type two correlations, these non-local types uh, seem to be the types that are relevant to the case of a topologically non-local observable. Um, so the general question then is can type two correlations underwrite a duality between topological and quantum entanglement? Um, in particular, can type two correlations, uh, well, can type two correlations be explained by direct causes and or common causes. Uh, the intuition here is that uh, uh, the non-locality associated with a quantum entanglement correlation uh, might be interpreted as a correlation that cannot be explained either by a direct cause or a common cause. Um, all right, so uh, uh, to conclude this lecture, right, we've looked at the RT formula uh, as a potential example of a duality between space-time topology and quantum entanglement. Um, and we've seen how, at least in its original formulation, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, its, in, in, in its current formulation, uh, in which it contains a quantum correction term on the right, uh, uh, it doesn't quite establish a duality, uh, but there are ways, proposals to reestablish the duality, right? Perhaps in terms of the R equals EPR uh, hypothesis. Um, and then we took a step back and considered, uh, uh, in general, uh, what issues might be associated with establishing a duality between topology and, and entanglement. Um, and we looked at two types of cases, state-based and observable-based approaches. And we saw that um, they both have their issues. Um, okay, I, I, I think uh, 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 that wraps up uh, this lecture. <laughs>